Part 1, Chapter 9 of Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert Translated by Eleanor Mark Saverling This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part 1, Chapter 9 Often when Charles was out, she took out from the cupboard between the folds of the linen where she had left it the green silk cigar case. She looked at it, opened it, and even smelt the odour of the lining, a mixture of verbena and tobacco. Whose was it? The Viscount's? Perhaps it was a present from his mistress. It had been embroidered on some rosewood frame, a pretty little thing, hidden from all eyes, that had occupied many hours and over which had fallen the soft curls of the pensive worker. A breath of love had passed over the stitches on the canvas. Each prick of the needle had fixed there a hope or a memory and all those interwoven threads of silk were but the continuity of the same silent passion. And then one morning the Viscount had taken it away with him. Of what had they spoken when it lay upon the wide-mantled chimneys between flower vases and pompadour clocks? She was at Tostes, he was at Paris now, far away. What was this Paris like? What a vague name! She repeated it in a low voice, for the mere pleasure of it. It rang in her ears like a great cathedral bell. It shone before her eyes, even on the labels of her pomade pots. At night, when the carriers passed under her windows in their cart singing the Marjolaine, she awoke and listened to the noise of the iron-bound wheels, which, as they gained the country road, was soon deadened by the soil. "'They will be there tomorrow," she said to herself and she followed them, in thought, up and down the hills, traversing villages, gliding along the high roads by the light of the stars. At the end of some indefinite distance there was always a confused spot into which her dream died. She bought a plan of Paris, and with the tip of her finger on the map she walked about the capital. She went up the boulevards, stopping at every turning, between the lines of the streets, in front of the white squares that represented the houses. At last she would close the lids of her weary eyes and see in the darkness the gas-jets flaring in the wind and the steps of carriages lowered with much noise before the peristyles of theatres. She took in La Cobaye, a ladies' journal, and Sylph des Salons, she devoured without skipping a word all the accounts of first nights, races and soirees, took interest in the debut of a singer, in the opening of a new shop. She knew the latest fashions, the addresses of the best tailors, the days of the bois and the opera. In Eugène Sue she studied descriptions of furniture, she read Balzac and George Sand, seeking in them imaginary satisfaction for her own desires. Even at table she had her book by her, and turned over the pages while Charles ate and talked to her. The memory of the Viscount always returned as she read. Between him and the imaginary personages she made comparisons. But the circle of which he was the centre gradually widened round him, and the aureole that he bore, fading from his form, broadened out beyond, lighting up her other dreams. Paris, more vague than the ocean, glimmered before Emma's eyes in an atmosphere of vermilion. The many lives that stirred amidst this tumult were, however, divided into parts, classed as distinct pictures. Emma perceived only two or three that hid from her all the rest, and in themselves represented all humanity. The world of ambassadors moved over polished floors in drawing-rooms lined with mirrors, round oval tables covered with velvet and gold-fringed cloths. There were dresses with trains, deep mysteries, anguish hidden beneath smiles. Then came the society of the duchesses. All were pale, all got up at four o'clock. The women, poor angels, wore English point on their petticoats, and the men, unappreciated geniuses under a frivolous outward seeming, rode horses to death at pleasure parties, spent the summer season at Baden, and towards the forties married heiresses. In the private rooms of restaurants, where one sups after midnight by the light of wax candles, laughed the motley crowd of men of letters and actresses. 
They were prodigal as kings, full of ideal, ambitious, fantastic frenzy. This was an existence outside that of all others, between heaven and earth, in the midst of storms, having something of the sublime. For the rest of the world, it was lost, with no particular place, and as if non-existent. The nearer things were, moreover, the more her thoughts turned away from them. All her immediate surroundings, the wearisome country, the middle-class imbeciles, the mediocrity of existence, seemed to her exceptional, a peculiar chance that had caught hold of her while beyond stretched, as far as the eye could see, an immense land of joys and passions. She confused in her desire the sensualities of luxury with the delights of the heart, elegance of manners with delicacy of sentiment. Do not love, like Indian plants, need a special soil, a particular temperature? Signs by moonlight, long embraces, tears flowing over yielded hands, all the fevers of the flesh and the languors of tenderness could not be separated from the balconies of great castles full of indolence, from boudoirs with silken curtains and thick carpets, well-filled flower stands, a bed on a raised dais, nor from the flashing of precious stones and the shoulder knots of liveries. The lad from the posting-house who came to groom the mare every morning passed through the passage with his heavy wooden shoes. There were holes in his blouse, his feet were bare in list slippers, and this was the groom in knee-breeches with whom she had to be content. His work done, he did not come back again all day, for Charles on his return put up his horse himself, unsaddled him and put on the halter, while the servant girl brought a bundle of straw and threw it as best she could into the manger. To replace Natasi, who left Tosters shedding torrents of tears, Emma took into her service a young girl of fourteen, an orphan with a sweet face. She forbade her wearing cotton caps, taught her to address her in the third person, to bring a glass of water on a plate, to knock before coming into a room, to iron, starch, and to dress her, wanted to make a lady's maid of her. The new servant obeyed without a murmur, so as not to be sent away, and as Madame usually left the key in the sideboard, Felicite every evening took a small supply of sugar that she ate alone in her bed after she had said her prayers. Sometimes in the afternoon she went to chat with the postilions. Madame was in her room upstairs. She wore an open dressing gown that showed between the shawl facings of her bodice a pleated chamisette with three gold buttons. Her belt was a corded girdle with great tassels, and her small garnet-coloured slippers had a large knot of ribbon that fell over her instep. She had bought herself a blotting-book, writing-case, pen-holder, and envelopes, although she had no one to write to. She dusted her what-not, looked at herself in the glass, picked up a book, and then, dreaming between the lines, let it drop on her knees. She longed to travel, or to go back to her convent. She wished at the same time to die and to live in Paris. Charles, in snow and rain, trotted across country. He ate omelettes on farmhouse tables, poked his arm into damp beds, received the tepid spurt of bloodlettings in his face, listened to death rattles, examined basins, turned over a good deal of dirty linen. But every evening he found a blazing fire, his dinner ready, easy chairs, and a well-dressed woman, charming with an odour of freshness, though no one could say whence the perfume came, or if it were not her skin that made odorous her chemise. She charmed him by numerous attentions. Now it was some new way of arranging paper sconces for the candles, a flounce that she altered on her gown, or an extraordinary name for some very simple dish that the servant had spoilt, but the child swallowed with pleasure to the last mouthful. At Rouen she saw some ladies who wore a bunch of charms on the watch-chains. She bought some charms. She wanted for her mantelpiece two large blue glass vases, and some time after an ivory necessaire with a silver gilt thimble. The less Charles understood these refinements, the more they seduced him. They added something to the pleasure of the senses and to the comfort of his fireside. It was like a golden dust sanding all along the narrow path of his life. He was well, 
looked well. His reputation was firmly established. The country folk loved him because he was not proud. He petted the children, never went to the public house, and, moreover, his morals inspired confidence. He was specially successful with catars and chest complaints. Being much afraid of killing his patients, Charles in fact only prescribed sedatives from time to time, an emetic, a foot bath, or leeches. It was not that he was afraid of surgery. He bled people copiously, like horses, and for the taking out of teeth he had the devil's own wrist. Finally, to keep up with the times, he took in La Ruche Medicale, a new journal whose prospectus had been sent him. He read it a little after dinner, but in about five minutes the warmth of the room, added to the effect of his dinner, sent him to sleep. And he sat there, his chin on his two hands, and his hair spreading like a mane to the foot of the lamp. Emma looked at him and shrugged her shoulders. Why, at least, was not her husband one of those men of taciturn passions, who work at their books all night, and at last, when about sixty the age of rheumatism sets in, wear a string of orders on their ill-fitting black coat? She could have wished this name of Bovary, which was hers, had been illustrious to see it displayed at the booksellers, repeated in the newspapers, known to all France. But Charles had no ambition. An Ivato doctor whom he had lately met in consultation had somewhat humiliated him at the very bedside of the patient before the assembled relatives. When, in the evening, Charles told her this anecdote, Emma inveighed loudly against his colleague. Charles was much touched. He kissed her forehead with a tear in his eye. But she was angered with shame. She felt a wild desire to strike him. She went to open the window in the passage and breathed in the fresh air to calm herself. What a man! What a man! she said in a low voice, biting her lips. Besides, she was becoming more irritated with him. As he grew older, his manner grew heavier. At dessert, he cut the corks of the empty bottles. After eating, he cleaned his teeth with his tongue. In taking soup, he made a gurgling noise with every spoonful. And as he was getting fatter, the puffed-out cheeks seemed to push the eyes, always small, up to the temples. Sometimes Emma tucked the red borders of his undervest onto his waistcoat, rearranged his cravat, and threw away the dirty gloves he was going to put on. And this was not as he fancied for himself. It was for herself by a diffusion of egotism, of nervous irritation. Sometimes, too, she told him of what she had read, such as a passage in a novel, of a new play, or an anecdote of the upper ten that she had seen in a feuilleton. For, after all, Charles was something, an ever-open ear, an ever-ready approbation. She confided many things to her greyhound. She would have done so to the logs in the fireplace, or to the pendulum of the clock. At the bottom of her heart, however, she was waiting for something to happen. Like shipwrecked sailors, she turned despairing eyes upon the solitude of her life, seeking afar off some white sail in the mists of the horizon. She did not know what this chance would be, what wind would bring at her, towards what shore it would drive her, if it would be a shallop or a three-decker, laden with anguish or full of bliss to the portholes. But each morning as she awoke, she hoped it would come that day. She listened to every sound, sprang up with a start, wondered that it did not come. Then at sunset, always more saddened, she longed for the morrow. Spring came round. With the first warm weather, when the pear trees began to blossom, she suffered from dyspnea. From the beginning of July, she counted how many weeks there were to October, thinking that perhaps the Marquis d'Anne de Villiers would give another ball at Vaubiessard. But all September passed without letters or visits. After the ennui of this disappointment, her heart once more remained empty, and then the same series of days recommenced. So now they would thus follow one another, always the same, immovable, and bringing nothing. Other lives, however flat, had at least the chance of some event. 
One adventure sometimes brought with it infinite consequences, and the scene changed. But nothing happened to her. God had willed it so. The future was a dark corridor, with its door at the end shut fast. She gave up music. What was the good of playing? Who would hear her? Since she could never, in a velvet gown with short sleeves, striking with her light fingers the ivory keys of an erard at a concert, feel the murmur of ecstasy envelop her like a breeze, it was not worth while boring herself with practising. Her drawing cardboard and her embroidery she left in the cupboard. What was the good? What was the good? Sewing irritated her. I have read everything, she said to herself and she sat there making the tongs red-hot, or looked at the rain falling. How sad she was on Sundays when vespers sounded. She listened with dull attention to each stroke of the cracked bell. A cat slowly walking over some roof put up his back in the pale rays of the sun. The wind on the high road blew up clouds of dust. Afar off, a dog sometimes howled, and the bell, keeping time, continued its monotonous ringing that died away over the fields. But the people came out from church, the women in waxed clogs, the peasants in new blouses, the little bare-headed children skipping along in front of them, all were going home. And after nightfall, five or six men, always the same, stayed playing at corks in front of the large door of the inn. The winter was severe. The windows every morning were covered with rime, and the light shining through them, dim as through ground glass, sometimes did not change the whole day long. At four o'clock the lamp had to be lighted. On fine days she went down into the garden. The dew had left on the cabbages a silver lace with long transparent threads spreading from one to the other. No birds were to be heard. Everything seemed asleep the espalier covered with straw and the vine like a great sick serpent under the coping of the wall along which, on drawing near, one saw the many-footed woodlice crawling. Under the spruce by the hedgerow, the curé in the three-cornered hat reading his breviary had lost his right foot, and the very plaster scaling off with the frost had left white scabs on his face. Then she went up again, shut her door, put on coals, and, fainting with the heat of the hearth, felt her boredom weigh more heavily than ever. She would have liked to go down and talk to the servant, but a sense of shame restrained her. Every day at the same time, the schoolmaster, in a black skull-cap, opened the shutters of his house, and the rural policeman, wearing his sabre over his blouse, passed by. Night and morning the post-horses, three by three, crossed the street to water at the pond. From time to time the bell of a public-house door rang, and when it was windy one could hear the little brass basins that served as signs for the hairdresser's shop creaking on their two rods. This shop had as decoration an old engraving of a fashion plate stuck against a window-pane and the wax bust of a woman with yellow hair. He too, the hairdresser, lamented his wasted calling, his hopeless future, and dreaming of some shop in a big town, at Rouen, for example, overlooking the harbour, near the theatre, he walked up and down all day from the Mary to the church, sombre and waiting for customers. When Madame Bovary looked up, she always saw him there, like a sentinel on duty, with his skull-cap over his ears and his vest of lasting. Sometimes in the afternoon, outside the window of her room, the head of a man appeared, a swarthy head with black whiskers, smiling slowly, with a broad, gentle smile that showed his white teeth. A waltz immediately began, and on the organ, in a little drawing-room, dancers the size of a finger, women in pink turbans, Tyroleans in jackets, monkeys in frock-coats, gentlemen in knee-breeches, turned and turned between the sofas, the consoles, multiplied in the bits of looking-glass held together at their corners by a piece of gold paper. The man turned his handle, looking to the right and left and up at the windows. Now and again, while he shot out a long squirt of brown saliva against the milestone, with his knee raised his instrument, whose hard straps tired his shoulder, and now, doleful and drawling, or gay and hurried, the music escaped from the box, 
droning through a curtain of pink taffeta under a brass claw in arabesque. There were airs played in other places at the theatres, sung in drawing rooms, danced to at night under lighted lustres, echoes of the world that reached even to Emma. Endless sarabands ran through her head, and like an Indian dancing girl on the flowers of a carpet, her thoughts leapt with the notes, swung from dream to dream, from sadness to sadness. When the man had caught some coppers in his cap, he drew down an old cover of blue cloth, hitched his organ onto his back, and went off with a heavy tread. She watched him going. But it was above all the meal times that were unbearable to her in this small room on the ground floor, with its smoking stove, its creaking door, the walls that sweated, the damp flags. All the bitterness in life seemed served up on her plate, and with smoke of the boiled beef there rose from her secret soul whiffs of sickliness. Charles was a slow eater. She played with a few nuts, or, leaning on her elbow, amused herself with drawing lines along the oilcloth table cover with the point of her knife. She now let everything in her household take care of itself, and Madame Bovary Senior, when she came to spend part of Lent at Tostes, was much surprised at the change. She, who was formerly so careful, so dainty, now passed whole days without dressing, wore grey cotton stockings and burnt tallow candles. She kept saying they must be economical since they were not rich, adding that she was very contented, very happy, that Tostas pleased her very much with other speeches that closed the mouth of her mother-in-law. Besides, Emma no longer seemed inclined to follow her advice. Once even, Madame Bovary, having thought fit to maintain that mistresses ought to keep an eye on the religion of their servants, she had answered with so angry a look and so cold a smile that the good woman did not interfere again. Emma was growing difficult, capricious. She ordered dishes for herself, then she did not touch them. One day drank only pure milk, the next cups of tea by the dozen. Often she persisted in not going out, then, stifling, threw open the windows and put on light dresses. After she had well scolded her servant, she gave her presents or sent her out to see neighbours, just as she sometimes threw beggars all the silver in her purse, although she was by no means tender-hearted or easily accessible to the feelings of others, like most country-bred people, who always retain in their souls something of the horny hardness of the paternal hands. Towards the end of February, old Rouault, in memory of his cure, himself brought his son-in-law a superb turkey and stayed three days at Tostas. Charles, being with his patients, Emma kept him company. He smoked in the room, spat on the fire-dogs, talked farming, calves, cows, poultry and municipal council, so that when he left she closed the door on him with a feeling of satisfaction that surprised even herself. Moreover, she no longer concealed her contempt for anything or anybody, and at times she set herself to express singular opinions, finding fault with that which others approved, and approving things perverse and immoral, all of which made her husband open his eyes widely. Would this misery last for ever? Would she never issue from it? Yet she was as good as all the women who were living happily, she had seen duchesses at Vaubiessard with clumsier waists and commoner ways, and she execrated the injustice of God. She leant her head against the walls to weep. She envied lives of stir, longed for masked balls, for violent pleasures, with all the wildness that she did not know, but that these must surely yield. She grew pale and suffered from palpitations of the heart. Charles prescribed valerian and camphor baths, Everything that was tried only seemed to irritate her the more. On certain days she chatted with feverish rapidity, and this over-excitement was suddenly followed by a state of torpor, in which she remained without speaking, without moving. What then revived her was pouring a bottle of eau de cologne over her arms. As she was continually complaining about Tostas, Charles fancied that her illness was no doubt due to some local cause, and fixing on this idea, began to think seriously of setting up elsewhere. From that moment she drank vinegar, contracted a sharp little cough, and completely lost her appetite. 
It cost Charles much to give up Tosters after living there four years, and when he was beginning to get on there. Yet, if it must be. He took her to Rouen to see his old master. It was a nervous complaint. Change of air was needed. After looking about him on this side and on that, Charles learnt that in the Neuchâtel arrondissement there was a considerable market town called Yonville l'Abbaye, whose doctor, a Polish refugee, had decamped a week before. Then he wrote to the chemist of the place to ask the number of the population, the distance from the nearest doctor, what his predecessor had made a year, and so forth. And the answer being satisfactory he made up his mind to move towards the spring, if Emma's health did not improve. One day, when, in view of her departure, she was tidying a drawer, something pricked her finger. It was a wire of her wedding bouquet. The orange blossoms were yellow with dust, and the silver-bordered satin ribbons frayed at the edges. She threw it into the fire. It flared up more quickly than dry straw. Then it was like a red bush in the cinders, slowly devoured. She watched it burn. The little pasteboard berries burst, the wire twisted, the gold lace melted, and the shriveled paper corollas fluttering like black butterflies at the back of the stove at last flew up the chimney. When they left Tostes at the month of March, Madame Bovary was pregnant. End of part one. Chapter 9